I'm uh, I'm David Sweener. I've uh, I was the first lawyer in the world to uh, start working full time on on policy measures to reduce cigarette smoking uh, 40 years ago. Uh, I have worked globally on these issues at uh, very senior levels on policy with uh, UN bodies, with law firms suing cigarette companies, with NGOs working on advocacy campaigns. Uh, I'm currently uh, have affiliations with the University of Ottawa Faculty of Law and chair of the advisory board for the Center for Health Law Policy and Ethics, and I'm the uh, on the global advisory board for the Boston University School of Public Health. So I I continue to stay very involved in in a lot of this. I, I've played a key role in uh, many of the precedents that we now see worldwide in reducing cigarette smoking, and I'm very keen to find other ones um, and move this ahead as, as rapidly as we can to, to deal with the, the carnage from the inhalation, unnecessary inhalation of smoke in order to get a drug that people are seeking. Okay, so first question I have for you uh, is, uh, can you tell me a little bit about the differences in the United States' approach to smoking cessation versus other countries like the United States? Uh, sorry, like the United, uh, United Kingdom. Sure. I mean, there, there's various uh, approaches around the world. Uh, and of course, the United States is such a huge country with so many people doing different things that it, it's hard to sum it all up in uh, a descriptor of, of the country in general. But were I to do that, uh, I think what we see in the U.S. is this tobacco-free world approach. And you'll actually see that on the websites of uh, of bodies like the National Cancer Institute, uh, the Centers for Disease Control. They're pursuing a tobacco-free world the way the United States has long pursued a drug-free world. Um, at some points, uh, an alcohol-free world, uh, no sex outside of marriage sort of world. Uh, that it's, it's more of an absolutist approach. Uh, whereas when we look at a place like the UK, where so many of the, the major policy players in looking at what can happen on cessation are people who themselves spent their career working with people who smoke cigarettes to help them quit. And I think the, there's a far greater recognition of the, uh, the, the lived experience of the people that, that they're trying to help. It's, it's not that they're, they're fighting a, a boogeyman. It's not that they, they think they can achieve uh, this you know, better world. We're just going to force everybody to change. It's, it's much more pragmatic uh, at saying, how do we meet people where they are? How do we understand their lived experience? How do we empower them to make better decisions about their own health? And in fact, exactly the things that we, we try to do in, in public health, we do public health well. Right. And we're going to get to this in a second, but it sounds like if you're doing that sort of more practical approach, um, you probably will end up having better success in the end because you're not going yeah, into this well, like, I, I, idealistic. I so. that, yes. I mean, it, it works far better than uh, uh, than saying, you know, I, I, I think people should exercise more. Therefore, I'm going to pass a law that everybody has to go jogging at dawn. Um, you know, it, that tends not to work very well. If you understand you know, what are the needs people have. Uh, what are they wanting to do? What's their lived experience? What are their barriers to, to doing what you might want them to do? Uh, how would you empower them to do more? And how do you accept that uh, they have agency? They, they are deciding about their own health. Uh, it isn't up to us to dictate what, what somebody can do. What we can do is empower them to do the sorts of things they want to do. We can inform them uh, about what their options are, what their risks are. Uh, we, we can talk, you know, meaningfully to them as, as adults rather than trying to, to dictate uh, lifestyles. Right, right. Um, so you mentioned that abstinence-only approach is problematic. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? What's fascinating is that, you know, it's, it's the idea, I, I think, that people can remake themselves and we can force them to remake themselves into better people. Uh, and it's, you know, sort of a, a wonderful idea. It's just that it doesn't work. Uh, it's almost invariably disastrous, as we've seen with the war on drugs, and we see with abstinence-only sex education, and we saw with uh, alcohol prohibition, and we're now seeing with abstinence-only on nicotine. So, but despite that, it keeps coming back. You know, we, we keep running into it again and again. That's that's really interesting. It's I I know. Uh... I'm reading a book right now uh, called Plague, which was written by Michael Bliss. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that one, um, but uh, he's writing about the history of Montreal and the, the outbreak of smallpox in like the 1850s to 70s. And um, the parallels to today uh, are incredible. 
like almost to like you can predict what the next news headline is going to be because the exact same thing happened and we're just doing it again. <laughs> There's almost a knee jerk uh, view that what we need to do is go authoritarian. Uh, and nobody's allowed to question us, and we'll never acknowledge that we were wrong. Uh, and we've seen in that a huge decline in trust. You know, the, the decline in trust in government, you know, from the time of John F. Kennedy, when somewhere in excess of 80% of Americans believed that you could trust the government to do the right thing all the time, or at least most of the time, to the, the, the year that Donald Trump was elected, and that was down to 16%. When we look at surveys of trust in government health information, you know, it's fallen precipitously before COVID. And the lack of trust, you know, in the United States, four out of 10 Americans reported they did not trust government health information, even some, you know, based on surveys by the UK charity, uh, the Wellcome Trust. Uh, and, and this, of course, ends up affecting what happens when you really need that trust. You, you need to have people believe you and, and act on what you're doing. And I think when we take authoritarian approaches, when we uh, we try to force people to change behavior. It's not surprising that that you get the uh, the pushback, and I think we see this on abstinence-only campaigns. That certainly any of us who grew up having an older brother will automatically rebel against authority telling us what to do, uh, and you know, so work with that and and try to find ways to to do something uh, better. And when we look at abstinence-only on just so many issues, uh, I mean, it'd be laughable if it wasn't. Um, if it wasn't so harmful. I mean, I remember being in South Carolina not, not that long before uh, COVID, and, and a headline in the Charleston paper was about sex education in the schools. And South Carolina has a huge rate of, of teenage pregnancy, and they only taught abstinence only. And their advisory board for the school board had, had recommended they have to do more than that. They have to let, because so many of these teens were already sexually active, they have to tell them what they could do to reduce their risks. And the school board unanimously rejected that because the only way to go was abstinence. And my gosh, if we started telling teenagers about sex, teenagers aren't even thinking about sex. And if we didn't this, they might start having sex. And you think that that's almost like, you know, some comedian's routine with the, the idea of teenagers, well, they're not even thinking about sex. But it's really ingrained in this idea of the uh, a purity standard that, uh, you know, we we will force this on people. Uh, we do not want to uh, to have people behaving in ways that we consider to be immoral. Right, right. When when we were emailing back and forth, um, you were telling me a little bit about uh, how smoking cessation surveys done in the United States and Canada don't necessarily always capture the popu the entire population well. Um, you know, do you feel that they're representative? I'm assuming the answer is no. <laughs> Yeah. Well, if we look at uh, overall uh, uh, survey designs, when we look at things like smoking, uh, we get the same sort of results when we look at other normative behaviors, behaviors that have judgments attached to them. So, I mean, we, for many, many years, the surveys showed that based on self-report, males have massively more heterosexual intercourse than females. Uh, we know that... Uh, you know, even 40 years ago, Canadians were reporting consuming three times as much broccoli as we grew or imported, uh, because that was seen as a positive behavior. Uh, the same as, you know, men would boast about sex, women would, 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 would be on the opposite side of that historically. We know that people will adjust what they say about drug use, uh, about their exercise level, about their diet, certainly about their alcohol consumption. When we look at surveys on cigarette smoking, if you take the total number of self-reported smokers and you multiply it by the average number of cigarettes per day they claim they smoke, you know, many of these surveys will show somewhere to like 40 to 50 percent of cigarettes being sold are unaccounted for. You know, it's just massive underreporting. Uh, that should be a reason to say, let's, let's think more deeply about this. But also because of the socioeconomic gradient on who smokes cigarettes now, uh, a very large percentage of cigarettes are consumed by people who've had a diagnosable psychiatric episode in the last 30 days. Many of those people don't answer surveys. You know, homeless people aren't answering surveys. People without telephones aren't answering surveys. Uh, many surveys are designed with, with a line saying if it looks like the person has a mental health issue, you know, you just discard them and move on to the next person. So the, the survey design is 
systematically missing the people who are most likely to be using the product you're you're trying to measure. So you know that that sort of thing creates uh, uh, creates serious problems. And we look at smoking cessation. People will say, "Yes, I want to quit smoking." Well, that's the uh, the socially desirable answer, which is what people give on surveys. Um, just like people say, I plan to lose weight, I plan to exercise more, I plan to spend more quality time with my kids. Uh, and so when people say, I plan to quit smoking, uh, and, and you have people working at reducing smoking, saying, great, you know, we're there, you know, over half of smokers say they plan to quit in the next year. Uh, well, again, no different than the number of people who say they plan to lose weight, they plan to exercise more, uh, they're, they're going to eat more healthily, uh, they're going to have a more balanced lifestyle. Uh, that you, you've got to look at where's that desirability bias and how do we get past that to understand what's really happening uh, and not get caught up in getting the answers that people are giving us because those are the answers they think that we want to hear. Right, right. Um, I want to pivot a little bit now to to treatments and uh, you know I want to know what you think about the current like smoking cessation treatments do you think that you know treatments are certain treatments are better for some people um, or do you feel like you know there's just some treatments are just not that successful at all and we probably shouldn't be using them well, I mean, if we look at uh, the whole area of treatment quite broadly, uh, you know, we have some treatments that are nothing more than, than snake oil, uh, the sorts of things that uh, you, know, you can get from so-called alternative medicine uh, practitioners. Uh, we also have pharmaceutical type products uh, and counseling products or counseling services uh, uh, and combinations of those things. And there's, there's reason to believe that, that many of the, at least pharmaceutical type products and the, the individual one-on-one -on -one counseling can be effective when, when used uh, 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 properly uh, in increasing the likelihood of smoking cessation. That said, when we consider that the, the likelihood of a cold turkey attempt on, on cigarette uh, smoking uh, uh, cessation one year out is low single digits. Um, I mean, that, that's incredibly low. And even if you double that, you know, you're, you're looking at, you know, maybe getting close to one out of 10 people being able to, to quit. Even when we look at the, the most intensive services with, you know, one-on-one -on -one help from a professional, lots of counseling, uh, uh, pharmaceutical interventions, our quit rates really don't get very high. We, you know, we sometimes measure them at being around 30%, but those sorts of services aren't scalable. You know, we can't provide that for each of the tens of millions of smokers in North America. Um, so I think, yes, we do have more successful uh, treatments. They, they're not nearly successful as we want. And in some cases, they're held back because of consumer misinformation. So for instance, you know, most people, including doctors, believe nicotine itself is what causes cancer. Uh, therefore, they're much less likely to use the nicotine replacement products to get them off uh, a cigarette smoking. They, they're less likely to use them. If they do use them, they won't use as much as they should. They won't use it for as long as they should. So in effect, they're hugely underdosing. So it would be like, you know, if somebody needed chemotherapy, but we gave it to them for one third of the time that they should be getting it. We gave them dosages that were a fraction of what they should be getting. And then people said, look, chemotherapy doesn't work. Uh, so I, I think that there's a lot of misinformation about the products. They're not used properly. They're still limited. They are expensive. And it's very hard to scale many of the better interventions. So, uh, you know, we've, we've, made, we've made progress, but there's a long way to go. And we need to understand that for a great many of the people who smoke cigarettes, they do not see themselves as ill. They don't think that they need a treatment. You know, they, they look at that the way that... You know, other people would probably look at their sedentary lifestyles. They don't need a doctor to intervene. They don't need a, uh, a pharmaceutical product. That's just them. That's just something they do. And again, we need to meet them where they are to understand what are their motivations, what would work for them. And in many cases, simply having an alternative source of nicotine that doesn't involve the inhalation of smoke, you know, would solve the problem. Because the, you know, the, the amazing thing here is that you know, cigarette smoking is killing roughly half a million Americans and about 48,000 Canadians every year, but it's the smoke that kills them. It's not the nicotine. You know, so in the UK, the Royal College of Physicians is very clear on this. And, uh, we've known since at least the 70s, people smoke to get nicotine, they die from the smoke. 
Uh, we see examples of where people get their nicotine without the inhalation of smoke, and the disease rates are, are tiny by comparison. So we, we could meet people where they are, give them viable alternatives, similar to what we've done historically on things like, uh, you know, if you're going to engage in what might otherwise be a hazardous uh, sexual activity, here's what you do to reduce your risk. If you are going to be using a drug, here's what you do to reduce your risk. If you're going to be engaging in certain high-impact sports, here's what you do to reduce your risk. Uh, and we've been very successful with that when you look at how much safer automobiles and airplanes and uh, industrial equipment and buildings and uh, foodstuffs uh, have become. I we could do the same sorts of things here, I think, if we got past that abstinence only, see it as a moral issue, see it as a sin approach, uh, and said, this is a public health issue. How do we pragmatically address it? Right. I'm going to I I'm gonna get back to this, I think, a little bit in a little bit. But um, one of the things I also want to ask you is, you know, what are some of the barriers that you think that you that people are pre preventing people from, you know, quitting smoking? Well, I think there's there, there's many. I mean, um, for some people, they do, they're not interested in quitting. Uh, I that that's certainly a barrier. But I, I think there's a lack of information about what their options are. Uh, you know, we saw last year um, in the United States, cigarette sales actually increased, which is you know phenomenal if you you think about that. And Altria, the biggest cigarette company in the in the United States with over half the cigarette market, attributes part of that to people who are moving from vaping products back to cigarettes because they were scared about the vaping products because of all the anti-vaping campaigns. Uh, well, uh, if that had gone the other way, uh, the way is happening in the UK of, you know, saying there's a huge difference in risk here. And, you know, if you're a cigarette smoker, switching to vaping can hugely improve your health. Uh, you know, it's a very different sort of message. So I think people need the information. They need access to uh, the alternative products. Uh, and we should be doing things that, that, that make the healthier choices the easier choices. And again, as part of that, understand where they're coming from, understand their lived experience. A tremendous number of, uh, of cigarettes are, are being consumed by people that I think we would uh, best describe their, their use as a matter of uh, self-dosing, self-medication, uh, in that uh, they find that the nicotine is helping them deal with some condition they've got, the gating effect of nicotine to deal with schizophrenia, for instance. Uh, and if we focus on things like that and understand why are they doing what they're doing, we're far better able to intervene. So it isn't just a matter of cessation. You know, it's like saying to somebody who's uh, consuming coffee, uh, Let's understand why they're consuming coffee. If they're saying they prefer not to be consuming as much coffee, is it that they're a night owl and they have a job that starts early in the morning? Is it that they're a long distance runner and the, the caffeine helps them with uh, uh, being able to, to have that endurance? Uh, you know, what, what's, what's going on with them? What's their lived experience? And I, I don't think we've, we're doing that effectively when we deal with nicotine to understand there's reasons you know, as uh, Gene Heyman says in his uh, wonderful book, uh, Addiction, a Disorder of Choice, one of the hallmarks of having consciousness is that we seek to alter it. And we seek to alter consciousness in all sorts of different ways. And we need to understand why people are doing the things that they are to alter their consciousness. And what can we do to reduce the risks that are inherent in that? Right, right. Um uh, now, to get back to what you were talking about a little bit earlier in the in the last question, um, you were kind of touching on, you know, having there's like almost like a community level that like you don't need to see a physician necessarily or a healthcare professional yeah. when you go to the to, to try and quit smoking. Like maybe there be something you can do at the community level. So I guess my question to you is, is, you know, in your view, what should the goal of smoking cessation public health programs be in, you know? Should that goal be any different than the role of the primary health care professional? Sure. I, I think uh, we need to look beyond uh, primary health care professionals because there are simply so many people who are smoking cigarettes. But that also so much of this comes down to, to policy issues. You know, for instance, when I got involved, 42% uh, of 15 to 19 year olds in Canada were daily smokers since the beginning of the 1980s. Uh, we got that down to 16% in 10 years, largely by using tax policy because young people were very price sensitive. Uh, and, and we reduced 
total uh, per capita consumption by 40%. Uh, no other country had done anything like that. And my argument was that this is policy. You know, understanding why people are getting sick is a medical scientific question. But dealing with it is a social, legal, political question. And maybe we need lawyers and politicians to be much more involved in getting those policy things that we can deal with things at a macro level rather than the patient at a time micro level. So I think that that sort of thing is, is, is very important in understanding, you know, what we can do. Uh, but I, I think to look at where is our potential support? You know, if you're trying to encourage people to be more active, uh, sporting uh, goods companies and sportswear manufacturers are your ally. Uh, you know, running shops, they're an ally. Um, people who are building a, a infrastructure that makes it easier for people to walk and run and bicycle, uh, they're allies. Uh, they're not a threat to you and your power. And here, when we look at something like uh, dealing with nicotine and, uh, and smoking cessation, you know, we've had a proliferation of innovative technologies that can give people who smoke cigarettes a viable alternative to cigarettes without inhaling smoke. Vaping being the most you know, recent example, but when we look at uh, some of the uh, smokeless products out of places like Sweden, or some of the heated products that have just reduced cigarette uh, sales in Japan by about 40% in just five years, that consumers are interested in the alternatives. How do we turn that to an advantage? You know, think of the way that innovation in the automotive sector dramatically reduced automobile fatalities. You know, in working with people who are coming up with innovation rather than oppose, opposing them, just like science-based pharmaceutical products replacing snake oil uh, uh, beginning in the uh, late 30s, uh, sanitary food replacing the unsanitary food. You know, we've, we've gone through these transitions, and I think uh, people working in this field should be looking at things like vape shops as allies, not as enemies to close down, but go in and talk to these people, talk to their customers, you know, learn what they're doing, how effective they're being, and work with them. And again, the way the UK does, some UK hospitals have vape shops in the hospital. You know, whereas in places like the United States, there's huge efforts to just close down the vape shops because uh, uh, people don't like them. It's not part of an abstinence-only agenda. Uh, so there's just so much more that we could do to you know, understand why people are, are smoking cigarettes and what we can do to effectively reduce that. And who can we work with? Who are the allies who can make that possible? Right, right. Now, I know that you've spent most of your career working in the policy space, uh, and we could go on at length about this. <laughs> I am, I'm very confident. Yeah. Um, but I do want to know, like, for like, like, what are some of the problems that you're dealing with right now? What are some of those policy nudges that you're trying to do right now that could help facilitate a move away from cigarette smoking? Sure. I mean, as, as a lawyer, I mean, we, we our profession tends to look at case studies, like, you know, who's had a similar situation? What have they done? If we look at things like how so many things become much, much safer over time, the sort of stuff Steven Pinker writes about in his book, Enlightenment Now, you know, how did airlines get way way less hazardous, you know, in automobiles and foodstuffs and industrial equipment and buildings are far less likely to catch on fire or fall over. Uh, children's sleepwear is not flammable anymore. Uh, we went through all these transitions and I think there's, there's a consistency of approach. I mean, part of it is to encourage the innovation for lower risk products. And you can do that through regulatory standards that make it possible to bring forward products like this, to make it easier to get them onto the market. Uh, but we, we can also look at what do we do in terms of information so that people know. So sanitary food, you know, the 1906 pure food law in the United States, people were scared about the sort of foods that were out there. You know, Upton Sinclair's book, The Jungle, had, had been out and people had been reading it and finding out what was happening in meatpacking plants. Being able to have food that, that was certified by a government agency as meeting sanitary standards. You know, uh, USDA approved uh, uh, on meat uh, had a huge impact in, in moving people. So information was really important. But also, once you create a, a, a standard that gives people choice and access to safer products, you know, we look at what happened in 1938 with the... Uh, uh, the, the, the new FDA law to, to move to science-based pharmaceuticals. You know, within a dozen years, 90% of the pharmaceuticals sold in the United States were products that did not exist before that law. 
It created the incentive. Business could say, we can make money by coming up with science-based products that replace the likes of Lydia Pinkham's vegetable compound and Dr. Graham's pink pills for pale people and all the sorts of products that had been sold with moving from leaded to unleaded gasoline. Uh, differential taxation uh, was used in many jurisdictions along with information. So saying, this is not only much better for the environment and for the health of the people around you, but it's less expensive. You know, because the tax on the leaded stuff is now higher than the tax on the unleaded. So when you go to the pump, you can save a few cents by putting unleaded gasoline in your car, and anybody who could did. Uh, so I think if we use that same approach here to say you want differential taxation reflecting differential risks, uh, something I wrote about with my colleagues Frank Chalupka and, and Ken Warner in the New England Journal of Medicine about five years ago, I uh, so that people have a financial incentive to move to the lower risk products. That played a huge role in my study of what happened in, uh, in Sweden in the switch from cigarettes to a non-combustion product. You know, make sure that safer product is taxed at a much lower level. There's an economic incentive to move to it. Use differential labeling. Use differential um, uh, standards in terms of where and when you can buy the product. You know, why should cigarettes be far more available than the low risk alternatives? Why should cigarettes you know, be cheaper? Why should cigarettes be packaged more, uh, more favorably? Uh, you know, why is it that uh, we've, in many cases, given advantage to the most hazardous product when we could be doing exactly the opposite? What you want to do is disadvantage the cigarettes through a, a range of restrictions on, on the marketing, the labeling, uh, the pricing, uh, so that people are, are nudged into moving to that, uh, that healthier uh, behavior. And as that starts to happen, you also have the, the further nudge, which is really pronounced in the United States, which is litigation. You know, if you've got companies that are continuing to sell cigarettes and not informing their consumers that there's massively less hazardous, acceptable alternatives, there's huge tort liability there. Uh, and I think that sort of thing pushes the companies to, uh, to behave in a, a much more responsible way. And we could probably have a very rapid... Uh, uh, destruction of the cigarette business as, as people move to the low-risk alternatives by simply using all those assets to our advantage the way that we've, we've seen happen historically on so many other things. There's, there's very few things where the differential in risk is so enormous uh, and also that the products that people are buying, that's a daily decision. It isn't like automobiles where you, you have to wait years for some people to move to a new automobile with safety features. Is that people who are buying cigarettes today could be buying something different tomorrow. You know, how do you cause that to happen? How do you facilitate that? And we have those tools available. It's a matter of how best to use them. I'd love one day to like sit down again with you and like we could talk about how could healthcare professionals sort of use their power to lobby to make some of these changes so that it doesn't have to be totally from a legal perspective uh, yeah. that it's done. But um, for time to be time conscious, um, <laughs> the next question I have is, is related to healthcare professionals. And that is, I've, I worked as a nurse for a few years here in Ottawa and, and I work with a lot of, I know many of my colleagues are still in the sort of the primary care role as a physician or as a nurse what are what are some better ways that we can educate healthcare professionals or, or what are how do we better educate uh, healthcare professionals on the risk of nicotine and smoking consumption because you know all this i didn't really know most of this and this yeah. is me reading like the sources that we would right. all go to well, I mean, Kyle, as you will know from your own training, and uh, I certainly see with, uh, with medical training, with my, my daughter being in her final year of residency in internal medicine in Toronto now, uh, there's very little taught to our healthcare professionals about preventative medicine. We, we have a model of dealing with sickness, uh, not one of how do we prevent that from happening. So, it, which, which is extraordinary given that prevention is just massively more cost effective than, than interventions once people get ill. Again, it's, it's, it's a hard area for scientists and doctors to get into because you know, policy isn't their area. But to the, there's many who have played a key role in, in trying to, to change things, and they can because of uh, the credibility that the public ascribes to, to these health professionals. So I think we can we could do more with the training. Um, uh, there needs to be ongoing um, uh, training, uh, you know, through, through the lifetime of professionals, 
But when we see things like surveys telling us that most doctors think nicotine causes cancer, you know, most think nicotine causes cardiovascular disease, most think nicotine causes lung disease, uh, you know, that requires an intervention. And I think the, the medical associations, the licensing bodies should be playing more of a role in that to say doctors are misinformed on our leading cause of preventable death. Uh, a leading cause of preventable death where the solutions are actually not that complicated, but they're being held back because of that misinformation. How do we educate doctors? Simply making them aware that they're misinformed could be a very important first step uh, to, to raise the, uh, the curiosity about what is going on here and what might we be able to do. Right. Looking at my questions, I realize my last question is really a repeat of an earlier question. So I, I won't I won't follow with that one. Um, this has been an absolute pleasure, uh, David. Thank you so much for like sharing your expertise on this and giving me, at the very least, a very unique perspective on this that I hadn't really considered before. And I went to U of O for my nursing program and we had a lot of great guest speakers come in, but I do wish that we had had you um, there <laughs> for at least a 30 minute section um, when I was when I was there. Uh, that'd be great. I mean, I, I do enjoy talking to, uh, to students. I was giving a talk to law students last night on on these policy issues. But I, I think uh, being able to get uh, new people who are open to new ideas is just so important. And there are very few things where we can make as big a difference in uh, in human well-being than what we can do in areas of preventive medicine. And we consider things like the deaths caused by air pollution, by cigarette smoking, uh, by traffic accidents, uh, alcohol abuse, uh, obesity, account for something like 40% of all the deaths that are going to occur worldwide this year. And we have the ability to intervene on that in very cost-effective ways. Uh, we, we have chances to dramatically reduce those deaths. And and that's just such an extraordinary opportunity. It's one not to be missed. And I think we have to get much more creative in our approach towards it.